Hi there. Welcome to Panama Baptist Church Online. So glad that you're able to be with us today. My name is Andy Cook. I have a couple announcements to pass on to you as we get started. First, there will be a meeting for members June 6th at 10 a.m. It'll be a very informative time, plus members, we need you to vote on a couple things, so hope you can be there. It's June 6th, 10 a.m. at PBC. Second, Panama Baptist Church is gonna donate all the money that is given to the church between June 1st and June 8th to our special mission trip project in Alaska. So if you want to help with the project, all you have to do is just give online or send a check between June 1 and June 8, and that money will be passed on to that project. Here's what we're going to do. A, a portion of the money will be used to help with incidental expenses related to the trip, but the majority of the money will be going straight to Kingdom Air Corps. And they're going to use it to buy supplies for the projects that this summer's teams, including ours, will be working on. Check out this video for a little bit more about Kingdom Air Corps. Oh, this is a wonderful time to be able to get together. Greetings, church family. Uh, for those of you who may not know me, my name is Tim Cook, and I've been involved in for the past five years with a ministry uh, called Kingdom Air Corps that's uh, located about an hour and a half northeast of Anchorage. And um, this year, I'm extremely excited just to, to come before you and uh, be able to talk a little bit about it and our involvement with it as a church. So... Kingdom Air Corps' purpose and mission is to be able to train missionary pilots, uh, and these pilots come from around the world for missionary service, and it, and it does so in such a way as to try to keep their cost at a very uh, minimum, which helps them to get to the field uh, quicker and to be able to not be downloaded with debt. And so uh, my role has been going up with my family and acting as a flight instructor and volunteering my time. But this year, I'm extremely excited because a church from Panama Baptist will be coming up uh, July 26th to join uh, my family while we're up there, and they're going to be doing um, basically a missions trip to Kingdom Air Corps. And one of the things that uh, has been brought forth was the opportunity to have some funds donated and from the church um, to support the work that's going to be happening there. So I encourage you, if you have an opportunity or if you haven't ever known much about this ministry, to look online at Kingdom Air Corps. Um, you can just Google it. And what you'll see there is that it's kind of like a, a camp-type uh, atmosphere where there's a runway that runs down through the center of the facility with several other buildings, um, a cafeteria, a large hangar, and then several cabins. So there are several... Um, missionaries that are on staff at Kingdom Air Corps. And one of the things that we're ho hoping to do this summer is to build a staff house um, for a couple that uh, will be living in it with their family uh, full full time. And up there in Alaska, it's really, really cold. So there's not many of these buildings that are winterized. And so this will be a winterized house. And so that will be one of the projects that will be uh, taking place this summer. Another project is that because they are up on a kind of a mountainside going down into a river bottom, they haven't been able to uh, have a good water supply. And so they just recently were able to put in a well, and now they have to figure out how to get basically the water line from down near the bottom of the river, uh, about a quarter of a mile to a little bit more up to up onto the mountainside. And so uh, there's a lot of work that goes into clearing uh, basically the trees and to get that water line all the way up up the hill. Another project that's going to be taking place is working on a roof of uh, a building that has been there, an existing house, but it has some water damage and so there needs to be some work that is done uh, on that roof and as well as some other smaller projects such as uh, some fencing that will protect people from as they get over closer to the river um, that they obviously won't uh, fall into the river and so forth. So there's probably four to five uh, fairly large projects this year that are taking place. And I am so thankful for the opportunity to be there and also to have a team come up from Panama Baptist. We covet your prayers. And if God leads you to give, um, I know that he will use your, your gift in a, in, a, in a great way to further the kingdom as it helps the people to uh, gain the skills they need to take the gospel to the ends of the earth. Thank you so much. At the time of this recording, it's Memorial Day weekend. Would you please join me in remembering those who have sacrificed their lives?
Our service today is following a bit of a different format. Pastor Joel is going to bring us three mini-sermons. Here's the first one. Today marks the final week for our series in the study of Colossians. There's four chapters in the book of Colossians. We're going to cover chapter four today. But we've spent the last several weeks going through the first three chapters. Now, maybe you've missed one of the weeks in the past, or maybe we just need to refresh our minds a little bit. Uh, what have we talked about so far for, through the first three chapters? Again, as this all fits together and flows together as one long letter that Paul would have written. Paul starts out in chapter 1 by giving thanks to God. Why? Because of the faithfulness that he's seen in this church that he is writing to. That God is the one that has been enabling and empowering this church in their faithfulness. The Paul says, don't be satisfied with that. Don't just stop there. Don't coast. But continue to pursue after Jesus. That there should be this growth in our lives and becoming more like Christ. And why is it that we should be pursuing after Jesus? In the last part of chapter 1, Paul lays out the case that Jesus is worth it. That Jesus reigns supreme. He is the central figure in our lives. And so he is the one that we should be pursuing. And as we are pursuing Jesus, we find knowledge and wisdom. And we need that knowledge and wisdom, Paul goes on to say in chapter 2, because we're going to be tempted to sway one way towards the world and their empty philosophy. Or we might be tempted to go too far the other direction towards legalism where we think we can earn our own righteousness. But Paul makes clear to us that Jesus, through his work, on the cross has, is the one that has declared us righteous. And so as we are pursuing after Jesus, not swaying too far one way or the, other, or the other, instead we keep our eyes focusing on becoming like Jesus. And as we're doing that, as we're focusing on Jesus and pursuing after Him, we're putting off the old man, our, our old nature. There's that decisive action that we're taking to get rid of some of these qualities like greed and, and lust and anger, Paul says. Instead, we're putting on the new man. We're growing in this process of putting on things like kindness and gentleness, humility, forgiveness, patience, and above all, love, Paul says. And then last week we looked at those qualities and then how Paul said in the end of chapter 3 that there isn't any, re any relationship or any area of our lives that is not impacted by the gospel of Jesus Christ. Remember we looked at the Roman culture last week, what the family unit would have been like that Paul was writing to, and now Paul's giving instructions to the wife and to the husband and to the dad and, and to the kids, to the masters and to the slaves, that the gospel of Jesus Christ makes us different than everybody else. And so we should be acting like it because all of this uh, truth that Paul's been giving to us impacts, uh, permeates everything that we are. So we bring Colossians to a close this week, and we're going to look at three different phrases that Paul uses in chapter 4. We're not going to cover everything in chapter 4, but three things that I want to dial in on. We're going to do a little bit different this week, as Pastor Andy mentioned uh, just a couple of minutes ago. We're going to be, I'm going to be doing this in the form of a sermonette. Three different sermonettes, short little sermons uh, with a song in between. Uh, each one, three different phrases that Paul used. These kind of all stand independent of one another, yet like the book itself, it all ties together. So here we go. Let's talk about sermonette number one. The first phrase that I want to focus in on that Paul uses in his closing in chapter four is this, devote yourselves to prayer, stay alert in it with thanksgiving. Now this phrase comes out of verse 2 in chapter 4. Now remember, Paul just got done in chapter 3 talking about how the, the gospel infuses every area of our lives, that we should be different because of our pursuit of Jesus Christ. And now he's closing, and he's going to give us kind of a, a tip or a reminder on how do we do that? How do we put on this new man? So let's read chapter 4, verses 2 through 6. Devote yourselves to prayer. Stay alert in it with thanksgiving. At the same time, pray also for us that God may open a door to us for the word to speak the mystery of Christ for which I am in chains, so that I may make it known as I should. Act wisely toward outsiders, making the most of the time. Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how that you should answer each person. The first phrase that I want to focus in on during sermonette number one here is devote yourselves to prayer. 
I don't think it's any coincidence that after Paul just gets done in chapter 3 telling us about putting on the new man that we should growing to be like Christ, grow to be like Christ, and that every relationship in our lives is affected by the gospel, that Paul then starts with the phrase, devote yourselves to prayer. As if he's saying, that, listen, this is, this is the key. This is the direction that you need to go if you want to grow to be like Christ. And so that word, devote, faithfulness, to persist, to be dedicated, to continue in prayer. The Olympics are coming up here in the summer if they don't get delayed again. And I enjoy watching the Olympics, but I always think about the dedication and the devotion that it must take these athletes to just practice their sport or practice their craft over and over and over for hundreds and thousands of hours. And you would follow this athlete around and you would say they're, they're pretty devoted to their sport. There's an author named Malcolm Gladwell. He wrote a book about 15 years ago called Outliers. And in this book, he had done uh, quite a bit of research on people that, had, that were successful in their craft. And he came up with the theory of 10,000 hours. Maybe you've heard of this before. But this idea that in order to be successful at your craft, say you wanted to, to start playing the piano, and I don't just mean be successful playing the piano, like you wanted to uh, master it and be way ahead of the pack when it came to playing the piano, for example, that you would have to practice a good practice for 10,000 hours to really just master it. 10,000 hours. So let's say you practiced for three hours a day. You got done eating dinner, so shortly after dinner, let's say you practice from 7 p.m. to 10 p.m. every day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. You practice the piano for three hours a day. It would take you just about 10 years, 10 years to get to 10,000 hours. And if you got done with that and you could then master the piano, people would say you are devoted to playing the piano. Uh, Paul is telling us, Listen, in this pursuit after Jesus, who is worth it, devote yourselves to prayer. We see this in a lot of Paul's writings and in the early church. Romans chapter 12, verse 12, rejoice in hope, be patient in affliction, be persistent in prayer. Acts chapter 2, verse 42, this is a description of the early church. They devoted themselves, there's that word again, to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Acts chapter 6 verse 4, but we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. Paul practices what it is that he's teaching. We see over and over in his writings, we've looked at it even here in Colossians, where Paul is, is always praying and, and giving thanks or praying to God for things, for these people that he's interacting with. But not only is he practicing it, he's, he's prescribing this prayer life for all of us. For all of us believers. And I think part of Paul's point here when he says devote yourselves to prayer is that we have to be proactive with prayer. It's something like, have you ever taken medicine for anything? Uh, like sometimes I, sometimes I struggle with like acid reflux uh, a little bit and so I've got this omeprazole that I take. Uh, the problem is, is, I, is I, they say in order for this to be successful you have to take this every day on a regular basis even if you don't feel like you need to take it but that's sometimes what I do. Like if I can feel just a little bit of heartburn or something then I'll get this out and I'll take it but if I wake up on a particular morning and I feel fine often I forget to take it. I only go to it when I need it. You know sometimes we do that same thing with prayer. Don't we? If we're being honest, often we only think about prayer or going to God when we, when we need something, when we're feeling that pressure. But prayer is, is so important because it's acknowledging our dependence upon God. Prayer is the catalyst. It is the engine that drives this process of sanctification. Why do I say that? Because it's God that enables us to grow. It's God that empowers us to grow, to be like His Son, Jesus. We've seen this in verses. Let me read some more verses for you where we see this concept written about. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 11 and 12. In view of this, we always pray for you, that our God will make you worthy of His calling and by His power fulfill 
your every desire to do good and your work produced by faith. We have that desire to grow, but it's through prayer to God that God fulfills that desire through His power. Colossians chapter 1, verse 3, We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you. Why do they thank God? Because of the work that He's done with the faithfulness and the love and the hope in their lives. Colossians chapter 1, verse 9, For this reason also, since the day we heard this, we haven't stopped praying for you. We are asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of His will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. We see this theme of prayer all throughout these verses because Paul knew it was God that enabled them. It was by God's power through prayer that people were growing to be like Jesus. And Paul wanted this church to keep growing, and so Paul starts by praying for them. But then he continues there and encourages them and exhorts them, listen, you need to be praying for this growth as well. We're going to be really heavy on the application here during these uh, th this week for these three sermonettes. So let me start by asking you this question to think about. If you've been listening to this series on Colossians that's kind of been about spiritual growth and this sanctification process of being more like Christ, and you're like, okay, I'm here, but I'm supposed to be here, and I, I'm not really growing like I think that I should, and I'm, I'm frustrated by that. I get discouraged by that. Ask yourself this question. If someone followed you around for one week, would they come away for that week saying, you're devoted to prayer? If someone followed me around for a week, would they say, well, Joel, he's, he's devoted to prayer? You know, to think back to the Olympics, I'm sure if we follow like an Olympic athlete around that was training for the Olympic Games and they were just, practicing and, and, and sharpening their craft the entire time, you would walk away saying, boy, that person, that, they're devoted to what it is they're doing. Every decision that they're making down to their, their exercise patterns and their diet and their routine and their sleep habits, it all is focused around getting better at whatever their event might be. And they're, they're devoted to that. Would they say the same thing about you and me if they followed us around? Would they come out of there saying, boy, that person... They're devoted to prayer. Uh, probably in a lot of cases, that's not the impression that they would have. And so Paul is exhorting us, devote yourselves to prayer because that's the catalyst to growing to be like Christ. Uh, there's probably a couple of reasons we don't devote ourselves to prayer like we should. Uh, probably the first reason is, is that we don't view it as a high enough priority. It's not important enough to us. If we viewed it as, as important as it really is, then we would be making the time for it. And probably the second reason is that we waste more time than we think. I know for me, I've got an iPhone. Android users, I don't know if your phone does this or not, but for iPhone users, every Sunday morning, right at about 9.30, my phone dings and I get a report. If you have an iPhone, maybe you get this report too, and it's probably providence that it comes on Sunday morning right before the in-person gathering starts or in the middle of the live chat. But my iPhone screen will pop up and it says, you averaged this amount of time looking at your phone every day this week. And it gives you a report of how much time you spent on your phone. Oh boy, and, and every week that number is higher than it ought to be. Man, if I just I could put my phone down a little bit more, how much more time would I have to devoting to prayer? Maybe that's a question you want to ask yourself this week. Now, now look, I'm not trying to guilt you. That's not the purpose of this. Paul didn't do that in his writing. Paul wasn't trying to guilt his readers into praying more. But what Paul was trying to do and what I'm trying to do is to encourage and exhort you uh, to remind you that, listen, we don't pray more so that God loves us more, so that we could be a good Christian. That's not the point. Uh, what Paul was encouraging us with was that he was reminding us throughout the book of Colossians what Jesus has done for you, uh, who Jesus is. And because of what Jesus has done, because we've been loved by God, we want to grow more like Him, and that is the motivation behind our prayer. We need prayer to propel us forward. Martin Luther said, to be a Christian without prayer 
is no more possible than to be alive without breathing. And so you want to devote yourself to prayer a little bit more this week. So you set a goal to spend some more time in prayer this week than you did last. Here's three ways that you can pray this week. First of all, start in the way that Paul started. Thank God for the ways that you have seen God at work in your life already. Thank God for the blessings that He has given to you and the growth that He has already empowered you to have. The second way that you can pray is read through Colossians chapter 3, verses 5 through 9. That's the list of things that we're to be putting off, that old man, that decisive action. Ask God to show you what needs pruning. God, what qualities are listed here that I, I really need to work on? Would you, would you put something in my mind, put something on my heart that I need to work on here? And the third way that you can pray is kind of the flip side of that question. Read through Colossians chapter 3, verses 12 through 14. That's the list of good qualities we're supposed to have, the kindness, uh, the gentleness, the humility, the forgiveness, the patience, and so on. Ask God to show you those situations where you need to grow. That when you get in those situations, it's like, okay, this is where I need to be having a little more patience, or this is where I need to be growing to be more, uh, have more humility uh, like Jesus had. God, would you prick my conscience? Would you, would you make me aware of those situations when I'm in there? Th- those are three ways that you can be praying this week as we work to devote ourselves to prayer uh, in this process of growing to be like Jesus Christ. All right, that's the end of sermonette number one. We're going to sing a song and then come back and look at a second phrase in Colossians chapter 4. Strength who rises, we wait upon the Lord, we will wait upon the Lord, we will wait upon the Lord. Strength who rises, we wait upon the Lord, we will wait upon the Lord, we will wait upon the Lord our God. You reign forever, our hope, our strong For the phrase that we're going to focus on here in sermonette number two, let's read chapter four, verses seven through nine. Tychicus, our dearly loved brother, faithful minister and fellow servant in the Lord, will tell you all the news about me. I have sent him to you for this very purpose, so that you may know how we are and so that he may encourage your hearts. 
He is coming with Onesimus, a faithful and dearly loved brother who is one of you. They will tell you about everything here. Paul then goes on in the rest of these verses to greet a lot of other people. He mentions several people by name. In fact, this is typically how Paul would close his book. Is he's going to or close his letter? He's he's kind of uh, uh, signing off, giving his final farewell. He's giving some instructions: let so and so know this, or tell this to this person for me, or welcome this one person. Just kind of just kind of a hodgepodge of a bunch of names and instructions that he's he's giving, and we we see him do this often. But in the verses that we just read. It, it would be really easy to kind of gloss over all these names and not think too much about it, just kind of fast forward to the end of the letter. But Paul mentions a person here, and he makes two statements about them that we need to dig into a little bit more, and that is the name Onesimus. Paul mentions Onesimus, and he he mentions two things. One is that Onesimus is a faithful and dearly loved brother. And then he says, Onesimus is one of you. Now, why is this so significant? It would have been really easy to miss this and to gloss right over it. Well, it's because we know a little bit more about Onesimus and who he was. Onesimus is the subject of the book of Philemon. Philemon's in the Bible. It's one chapter, a little bit later in the New Testament. It's written, Paul has written a letter to this person named Philemon. And Philemon had a runaway slave. Now, remember what we talked about last week about the Roman culture and slaves and how looked down upon they were. You can imagine slaves were not thought very highly of in this time. And Philemon had a slave who had run away, and that runaway slave, his name was Onesimus. Now, at some point, Onesimus, he encounters Paul And he becomes a Christian, he becomes a Christ follower through the ministry that Paul has. And so in the book of Philemon, Paul writes to Philemon on behalf of Onesimus. And he's trying to persuade Philemon to receive Onesimus uh, as he would receive Paul himself. And he says, listen, Philemon, don't don't punish him, please. Uh, Please don't put him to death, as that would have been the usual treatment for runaway slaves. That's what the culture would have been in this time. But remember Paul's point at the end of chapter 3, that the gospel, following after Jesus, it changes every relationship that we have. So by putting on the new man, this list of qualities that Paul gave us in chapter 3, the compassion, the kindness, humility, the gentleness, the patience, the forgiveness, the love that binds all of it together, It should change how we interact and treat and receive people. That's been what Paul has been talking about in chapter 3. But now, in chapter 4, as Paul is closing this letter, he's giving this church in Colossae a test. He's giving them a challenge. He's moving now from theory to real-life application. The church would have known who Onesimus was. And now Paul is saying, okay, we've talked about this. We've talked about how you are one in Christ, and here comes somebody that you might be tempted to dismiss as lesser than you, but you are to welcome him as one of you. How is this going to play out in real life, Paul's saying? It's like when we talk about in, on Sunday mornings, you, you know, like we need to have more patience uh, with road rage, right? Like when someone cuts us off and we all nod our heads, yep, yep, I need to be more patient. That's, uh, I get that. And then on our way home from church, somebody pulls out in front of us and cuts us off. How are we going to respond? When we talk about loving our enemies, and, oh, okay, sure, yeah, I can do that, I can do that, no problem. And then we discover that we have an enemy, and they're not real nice to us. How are we going to respond? We talk about forgiving our fellow brothers and sisters in Christ when they've committed a grievance against us and we nod our heads when we listen to the preacher talk about it and say, okay, yep, I can do that. And then one of our brothers and sisters in Christ commits a grievance against us. Oh, it gets a little tougher then. It's easy to love and accept the people that are like us. But how are we going to receive someone when the only thing they have in common is Jesus. Think about this and what Paul, who Paul was writing to. Paul, a, a Jewish Christian apostle, was writing to Philemon, a wealthy Gentile 
slave owner. He's writing to this church in Colossae, and he's writing to this runaway slave, Onesimus. So what do they have in common? Nothing. They don't have anything in common. In fact, they would have found themselves on opposite sides of several different lines, except they are united as brothers in Christ. Because our relationship to Christ changes all of our other relationships. And so Paul reminds us here in the book of Colossians, and he reminded us in the book of Philemon, that being in Christ changes how we treat other people, uh, changes how we accept our brothers and sisters in Christ, especially those that would be of different social or racial or economic situations. And Paul is giving this church, in the closing of this letter, an opportunity to show that this isn't just a theory. We're not just talking about this like pie-in-the-sky type stuff. There is practical application that's demanded of us in our everyday lives. Think about where Onesimus and this church would have been. They would have been on different sides of the line socially. Uh, one was a slave. The others weren't. Uh, one wouldn't have had any money. The others did. And on and on the list would go. But the truth of the matter is, is, is that we have, we have far more in common with a fellow brother or sister in Christ who would line up on the opposite of every one of those lines, whether it's social or economical or political or racial lines. We have far more in common with that person because of our bond in Christ than we do with someone who would check every one of those boxes and be on the same side of the line as us, but they don't know Jesus. So Paul, in his closing in chapter 4, is telling them, Here comes Onesimus. He is one of you. How are you going to accept him? So the application question, as we bring sermon at number 2 to a close, is this. Is there someone in your life, a fellow brother or sister in Christ, that you haven't accepted or welcomed back in the same way that Jesus has accepted you? That's the question to think about that Paul leaves us with here in Colossians chapter 4. One more song, and then we're going to close the book together. Be still, there is a healer. His love is deeper than the sea. His mercy is unfailing his arms a fortress for the weak let faith
Our final phrase in chapter 4 that we're going to focus in on, and with this bring the book of Colossians to a close, is the last verse of chapter 4, verse 18. I, Paul, am writing this greeting with my own hand. Remember my chains. Grace be with you. In this closing chapter, we find out that Paul is in prison when he wrote this letter. It's not really something Paul's mentioned up to this point. He did mention it a couple other times in verse 4. If we back up to verse 10, Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, sends you greetings. A few verses before that, verses 3 and 4. At the same time, pray also for us that God may open a door to us for the word to speak the mystery of Christ, for which I am in chains. And don't miss verse 4, so that I may make it known as I should. Paul is asking for their prayer to keep going, to keep pursuing himself after Jesus to further the kingdom in his gospel ministry. Paul's theme in this letter has been this idea of growth, to pursue after Jesus because Jesus is worth it. Paul has been saying that we should be decidedly different as people who love Jesus, because the outside world is watching us. He said that in verses 5 and 6 of chapter 4, Acts, act wisely toward outsiders making the most of the time. Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you should answer each person. And you might be expecting to get to the closing of a letter like this, expecting the hard sell. You know, like the, the salesman's coming in to close this pitch that he's been making about pursuing after Jesus because Jesus is worth it. And so you might potentially be expecting a, a salesman in a situation like this to just say, hey, this is going to be great. Life's going to be a bed of roses. You're going to have smooth sailing if you're pursuing after Jesus. There's not going to be any problems at all. Instead, Paul, the guy that's selling this to us, and I know I'm using that phrase uh, a little bit loosely there, but Paul, he's the one that's been talking to us. He's in prison for doing the things that he's encouraging us to do. He's in prison for, for pursuing after Jesus and for preaching the gospel. And not only that, but in verse 4 we just read, he, he wants to keep going. He wants to keep doing what he is doing. Why? Why would Paul want to keep going? Well, this book has been an explanation to the why. Because Jesus is worth it. And so when Paul is saying that Jesus is worth it, the hardships that we see in Paul's life, it underscores the importance of what it is that Paul is saying. Paul's been through his life while, while being beaten multiple times, and he's been shipwrecked multiple times, and he's been stoned, and he's now in prison, and yet he's still right here, right in our ears saying, listen, keep pursuing after Jesus because Jesus is worth it. We started this series several weeks ago using that illustration about Disney World. Do you remember that? We talked about what if you were waiting in line for a ride and your question the whole time was, was the ride at the end of this line going to be worth it? This pursuit, this, this waiting, this sacrifice, is all of this going to be worth it at the end? And here's Paul, the author of this letter, He's standing beside us in this ride of life, so to speak. And he's in our ear and he's saying, listen, this is going to be tough. This isn't going to be easy. You're going to be tempted to take the path of least resistance. Because often, it's not easy to be patient. It's not easy to be kind. It's not easy to love one another. This isn't going to be a bed of roses. He says, I, I've been on this ride. I've been to the end of this line, and I'm telling you, keep going. Stay focused on Jesus. Because even in the midst of all of these hardships, Jesus is worth it. Why? Well, let's close with the list that we started this series with. Paul outlines for us in Colossians chapter 1 that Jesus is the image of the invisible God. Jesus is the firstborn over all creation. Jesus is the sustaining creator. He's the head of the church. Jesus conquered death. God's fullness dwells in Jesus. Jesus is the peacemaker. 
Jesus has redeemed our lives from the pit, and Jesus has treated us with kindness and compassion and love and gentleness. But most of all, Jesus has forgiven us and redeemed us. And so Paul is saying, listen, pursuing after Jesus, it's ended me here. But it's still worth it. Jesus is supreme in our lives, and so pursue after him. Devote yourselves to prayer. Accept and love one another in the way that Jesus has accepted and loved you. And so this week, ask God to enable you. Ask God to empower you to grow a little more today than you did yesterday. That's my prayer for you as you work to be deployed throughout this week and in the coming months. God bless you. Thanks for being with us. We hope to hear from you soon. If you'd like to talk to one of the pastors, don't hesitate to reach out. Send us an email. Give us a phone call. We are here to help and serve you.